Um, well, welcome to New Life. Um, my name is Andy. I'm one of the pastors here at New Life. We're going to keep the lights down just for a second. Um, we have a video. And in this video, I saw this video this week, this clip this week, and it could, it could change your life. Because this video kind of, it kind of changed my life. So, I just, I, I, I just wanted to share this with you because this video is, it's, it's incredible. So I just, all right, so just, are you guys ready for it? Are you ready? Like, are, are you, have you guys, all right, let's, let's watch the video, then we'll kind of talk about it a little bit, okay? You're each going to lie in this box and separate it in three sections. You will reach into the snakes and grab the white snakes and then sort them and put them into a bit. Allison. What? Are you ready to get the I'm ready. started? Yeah. Oh, okay. Let's go. I'll be Oh, you alright? Yeah. I'll be Even college students, 
What is the number, this is for you, Caleb, what is the number one reason that, that college students come here, that you guys come here? It's not to become a better citizen, like Caleb would, would like. You know, it's not even for fun. It's not even for the, you know, to make friends. It's not even to find a spouse, which is kind of my reason to go. Like, it was, it's the number one reason is career and financial advancement. So I think, all, I think this affects all of us. I think we are all driven by money in some way, shape, or form. And if you haven't been around here for the last couple weeks, we've been going through this series called Binge. We've been talking about these areas of excess within our culture. And so we're going to be talking about money today, and we're going to be asking the question, why? Like, why are we so crazy about money? Like, why would someone go into this little coffin and have cockroaches and snakes and worms dumped on them for $50,000? Why? Why are we so crazy about money, and what is God's take? So if you guys want to flip with me to 1 Timothy 6, we're going to be in 1 Timothy 6 today. So in 1 Timothy 6, 9... Paul's writing to Timothy. Timothy is like his right-hand guy. Um, and he says, in, in verse 9, he says, People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. So the first point in your bulletin is what we see in our culture is a get-rich mentality. So what we see in our culture is a get-rich mentality. Mentality, that there is this belief that money can buy you happiness. That if I had this amount of money, then I'd be free, that I'd be comfortable, I'd be secure, I'd have power, I'd be happy. That, you know, this idea that, man, I'd be able to do whatever I want. Have you ever thought of that? Like, if only I had a certain amount of money, I'd be able to do whatever I want. And I would be able to buy whatever I want. If only I had this certain amount, that with enough money we could actually buy the perfect life. Have you ever thought that before? I remember when I was, a, I was a junior in college and we took this trip to Chicago. Anybody like Chicago around here? Chicago's pretty awesome. So I went to Chicago with my friends and, and I could, like, I was, you know, God was doing a lot in my life at the time, but there's still a lot of, a lot of ideas of what I thought my life would look like that I just was kind of consumed about. So we, you know, we, were, we went to this TGI Fridays. I don't know why there's a TGI Fridays in the middle of like Chicago, but there's like this roof. And so we're on this roof of TGI Fridays, and we're in the middle of Chicago. And I'm, I'm looking around on top of this roof, and there's just these skyscrapers everywhere. And if you don't know, like I love the city, and I love skyscrapers, and I'm just enamored by it. And there's these high-rise condos everywhere. And at that time, I was like pursuing to be a doctor. And I was thinking, everything in my head at the time was like, man, if only I could just be a doctor, then I would do my residency here in Chicago, I'd have enough money to buy like one of these condos, and then I would just like look out into the city and be like, this is incredible. I was thinking about every little aspect of my life. I could work in the city, I'd probably date someone at the hospital, then we'd be like walk along the Magnificent Mile during Christmas, it'd be so romantic. Like I would have the perfect life if only I had this money. Then I could buy the condo, then I could do, do, do. If only I had money, I would have the perfect life. And do you not realize that that is what commercials sell us every day? They're selling us the perfect life. They are looking at every single one of us and saying, if you don't have this, you're going to be unhappy. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to make us dissatisfied. They're saying, if you don't have the latest phone, if you don't have the latest tablet, if you don't have the latest computer, the latest car, the latest shoes, the latest pair of jeans, the latest dress, the latest video game, the latest whatever, if you don't have those things, then you're actually going to be really unhappy. You're going to be really dissatisfied. And let me ask you a question. Have you ever bought something thinking that it's going to make you happy? Have you ever bought something just being like, man, if, if I buy that, I'm just going to be, I'm not going to have any other worry. Everything's just going to be perfect. Like we have this temptation to get rich in order to satisfy our desires, the things that we want, but not necessarily the things that we need. 
here's the reality. There are things that we need. You know, we need food, and we need clothes, and we need a roof over our head. Those are legitimate needs. But then what happens is that we kind of twist those about all of our wants. Like, we look at them like, well, what do we want? We actually want the five-star restaurant, and we want the designer jeans, and we want the house in Upper Arlington. And this is your second point, that there's a big difference between what we want and what we need. Like, I remember um, one of my friends, um, he loved Michael Jordan. Like, absolutely loved Michael Jordan growing up. So... You know, when, when, when the new pair, when the new Michael Jordans came out, like, he bought them. I mean, it was like the day of. He'd ask, he had it, like, circled on his counter, and he's like, Mom, I want the shoes on this date. So he, like, ended up getting the, the latest pair of Michael Jordans every year, all throughout high school. Then there was a point where he's like, I have, like, eight or nine pairs of Michael Jordans, so I need to actually go and, like, go on eBay and find all of the pairs. I need to go and get the one, the two, the three, the four, the five. So he's like, I have to get all of the pairs of Michael Jordans. That was his goal. It's not like he needed a new pair of shoes, but he just wanted all of the Michael Jordans because he had to have them. Like, he'd be the guy who would stand in line for like two hours the day, the night of, to get the pair of shoes. In college, his entire closet was stacked with Michael Jordans, with, with boxes of shoes. Like, he was just obsessed. He even to the point where it would rain and he would put bags on his shoes. This is, this is no joke. He put bags on his shoes because he didn't want his shoes to get messed up. He had a, a token pair of Jordans that were so jacked up that he was just like, these are the, the pair of my pair of shoes that I actually wear because these pairs are trash. And then I'll only wear like the shoes for certain occasions. So it's like he had his wedding Jordans. He had his, you know, like every, he had a, a pair of Jordans for every occasion. But the, my point being is that he didn't need a pair of shoes. He wanted a pair of shoes. He had to have more. He had to have more. You know, and this attitude, this is the attitude that we see in our culture. And it's kind of summed up in another clip. I have another video clip. Um, and it's, it's from this movie called Wall Street. I know it's an older movie, but it's a sweet movie. And uh, we're getting the clip. All right, so here's the clip from Wall Street. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that green, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed, in all of its forms, greed for life, for money, for love, knowledge has marked the upward surge of mankind and greed, you mark my words, will not only say it tell our paper, but that other malfunctioning corporation called the USA. Thank you very much. Perfect. So this is what our culture is telling us. Our culture is telling us greed is good. And my friend with the shoes, by definition, it's greed. The definition of greed is an inordinate desire to acquire or possess more than one needs. Our wants control us once our needs are eliminated. Our wants control us once our needs are eliminated. And here's the deal, folks. This even happens here in the church. It even happens in the church. You see Paul in verse um, 5 in this passage. We're not, we're not going to put it up. But basically he says, there are those that think that godliness is a means to financial gain. That there are those who are kind of talking about this idea of this health, wealth, and prosperity. Um, this idea that like, man, God just wants to bless you and he just wants you to have abundance. Like that's true. It's true that God wants you to have life and abundance. But we have twisted that term abundance to mean more and more money in order to get more and more stuff. Have you ever thought this? Have you ever thought like, man, if I do good, if I just like play by the rules, if I just like not piss God off, then that what that means is that he will actually like give me what I want. He won't be upset with me, so that means he'll give me what I want. 
Have you ever thought that? In the same way that we'd look at a parent and be like, I don't want to get my parents upset because if I'm nice to them, then they'll give me the candy bar that I want or the new car that I want. Have you ever thought that way towards God? You just want God to kind of bless your life, bless the things that you want, bless where you're going. And Paul basically is saying, like, he's saying this is a trap. He's saying this is going to lead to ruin and destruction. That's what he is saying. So maybe the question is why? You know, why is this, why would this lead to ruin and destruction? And that's point number two. And point number two is that greed is the root of many evils. Greed is the root of many evils. And in verse 10, in this passage, Paul says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. So greed is the root of many evils. And we see what it does is it does three things. And the first thing that it does is that we look up to those with more. We look up to those with more. We're, we're jealous, we're envious, we're covetous. We're like, I want what they have. And then we work tirelessly in order to catch up. And maybe, maybe you're in a place right now where you're, you know, you're just like, that's not me. But let me just throw out a warning. And maybe the, this entire message, you're like, that's not me. I don't even have a penny in my bank account. But let me just throw out a warning. This could be all of us. This will apply to you in maybe a year, or maybe two years, or three years, or maybe tomorrow, after you graduate. This applies to every single one of us. But have you ever heard the term, keeping up with the Joneses? You guys heard of that term? Well, the term actually came from this family, the last name of Jones. They were this uh, New York, this prominent New York City family during the late 1800s and the early 1900s, and they owned Chemical Bank, and so they like were this really wealthy family. They had all these people everywhere, um, and then they just decided, hey, we're going to go and build these villas, these incredible villas in Hudson Valley. So then all their friends got the same idea: the Astors, the Rockefellers. And everyone was like, man, we're going to move to Hudson Valley, and we're going to build these bigger and bigger and grander and grander villas. And so they just kept kind of going back and forth, trying to kind of keep up with them, each other. I mean, I even saw this in high school. I had two friends and two families. One family, they bought a BMW. The, the other family, they bought a Jaguar. One family finished their basement. The other family finished their basement. One family bought a flat screen, big, like a big flat screen TV, which at the time was like brand new. The other family, they bought, they bought one a couple inches bigger. One family installed surround sound. The other family installed surround sound. One family built or uh, bought a pool table. The other family bought a pool table. One family went on exotic vacation. The other family went on exotic vacation. And back and forth and back and forth. Like they just had to keep up with each other. And this is the reason, this is the reason that the whole housing crisis happened a few years ago, if you remember. Is that people my brother's age, they just were like, man, all my friends are buying a house. I don't have the money for it, but I have to buy a house because I have to keep up with them. So they bought this house and they didn't have the money for it. And then they're like, well, my friends, they, you know, my other friend, they bought a brand new TV. So they're like, I don't have the money for it, but I have to buy a brand new TV because that's what everyone else is doing. And then, oh, well, another friend, they bought a new car. Well, I have to buy a new car because, you know, everyone's buying a new car. And they just accrued more and more and more debt, paying for things that they absolutely had no money for. That is, that is America. That's what we've done. That's just not who we were created to be. Like, we look up to those who have more. That's the, that's the first little bullet point under point two. The second one under that is that we look down on those who have less. Have you ever been in that situation where, you know, you have an ability or you have even you just looked at it and you're like, well, if only they worked harder. You know, if only they would apply themselves. Like, have you ever thought that? But, but let, what if I told you that there's this, this huge wealth gap in our country? What if I told you that? What if I told you that just based on where you grew up, based on the zip code that you grew up, or based on the neighborhood where you grew up, or based on your last name, or based on even your skin color, that you, that, that you might have a greater opportunity or less opportunity? Would you think that that is a legit thing? 
Like imagine two people playing Monopoly. Like imagine if there's a, there's a blank board in front of you, but there's one person who gets twice as many rolls. And that same person, every time they pass go, they get twice as much money. Do you think that's fair? What do you think would happen? What do you think would happen at the end of that game? What do you think would happen maybe like two turns into that game? That person who has twice as many rolls is just going to keep flying around that board, buying up property after property after <coughs> property, and they're getting more money so they can buy more, they can build more houses. And the other person, they're screwed, man. They're just going to end up paying, paying that person, paying the, the other person. And then that person who has twice as much is going to be like, well, why aren't you doing better? They're going to start thinking, like, man, like, I'm the stuff. Like, I'm dominating. I win. Do not think that that happens here in this country. Do not think that happens even in our own hearts. <coughs> that some of us, just based on, and this happens even here in Columbus, if you're on one side of 71, you have less opportunities than if you're on the other side of 71. That's true. It's just a fact. Just based on where you're born, like, you might have all the, all the chances, and if not, then it's going to be tough. Just a big difference. So we look down. I think in our hearts, we look down <coughs> on those with less. And this is the third thing that happens, is that we look inward and not outward. Like, we can be so focused on the new thing, on the thing that we want, that it actually numbs us from seeing the needs of others. Has that ever happened to you guys? We're so focused on the thing that we want that it actually numbs us from seeing the needs of others. And it could even happen on this campus. You know, we just purchased the, you know, the new shoes, like my friend, or the new phone, or the, the new whatever it is. And we're so engrossed in that. We're so pumped about that. We're so jacked about that. And we literally, we park our car and we literally walk past someone who doesn't even have, they're, they're, in, they're looking in a dumpster and they don't even have food. We're so consumed with, with what we're doing. We're so consumed with what we want that we actually miss the needs of others. Like, this isn't a condemnation on, 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 on you guys. It's, not, it's, it's just like, this is just a reality of our culture. This is a reality of my own heart. That there's, a, there's a selfishness in us. Paul says that, that they've wandered, or they've been led astray. And that this, this is, if we continue with this pursuit, we're actually, it's actually going to lead us to a lot of grief. And let me, let me explain a story of how it can lead us to grief. Have you ever got, heard of a guy named Solomon? I talked about him a couple weeks ago. I feel like I'm ragging on Solomon every week. But the guy was, he kind of deserves to be ragged on sometimes. But basically, this is, this is Solomon. Solomon, at the time, this was like, that, like 3,000 years ago. He was like the richest man in the world. Like, just imagine this. He had 25 tons of gold brought to him every year. That's, that's 50,000 pounds of gold every year. He lived for like probably, you know, over 40 years. That's a lot of gold coming into your bank account every year. The guy had 12,000 horses. He had 1,400 chariots. He literally, like his throne was made of ivory and gold. And then the steps coming up to his throne, there were lions on the steps. Not fake lions, real lions. <laughs> Who does that? Like, did he tame these lions? I don't know. Like, but he has these real lions coming up to his throne. So when you're like walking up the throne and you're seeing Solomon, you're like, this guy's kind of like the real deal, man. Like, he built houses, he built gardens, he built vineyards, he built all this stuff. And this is what he says in Ecclesiastes 5. I don't have to flip there. I'll just read it to you. I just want you to listen to it. This is what he says in Ecclesiastes 5, verse 10. He says, whoever, this is from the words of Solomon. This is like the richest man on the planet at this time. This is what he's saying. He's saying, whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owner except to feast his eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. I've seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owner. 
or love lost through some misfortune, so that when he has a son, there is nothing left for him. Naked a man comes from his mother's womb, and as he comes, so he departs. He takes nothing from his labor that he can carry in his hand. This, too, is a grievous evil. As a man comes, so he departs. And, when, and what he does gain. And what does he gain since he toils for the wind? All his days he eats in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. This is what Solomon is saying here. He's basically, he, has, he has everything that you can imagine. He's basically saying, this is meaningless. This is vanity. He's saying that there's nothing gained. He's actually saying that it has led to more frustration and anger and despair. He's saying that seeking happiness through money and the stuff that it can buy actually doesn't bring satisfaction, but it brings more dissatisfaction. This guy's the richest man on the planet, and he can't sleep at night. So what, what is the real issue? What's the real issue in all of us? What's the real issue even within, our, even within our culture? What is the real issue here? The real issue is a heart issue. That's the real issue. Is that our heart just desires what can't last. Our heart desires what won't satisfy. That's, that's the real issue. Let's, let's flip to another passage, another verse real quick. It's in Matthew 6. It will be on the screen. Let's see what Jesus actually has to say about this. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He's saying no one can serve two masters. Either, you, either I'm skipping down to 24. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both, both God and money. Now here we have Paul. Paul is basically saying, you need to seek, or we have Solomon who basically is saying, you need to seek after a new treasure. And then you have Jesus saying, you have to seek after a new treasure. And let me ask a question. Is Christ the treasure that drives your life? Is Christ the treasure that drives your life? Or is money and the life that money can buy, is that competing for our devotion? <coughs> or is money and the life that money can buy, is that competing with Christ for our devotion? The third point, I skipped ahead just a little bit, the third point is that we can't serve two masters. We can't serve two masters, but we must choose. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's, he's being pretty point blank. He's saying, you can't, those treasures, those things that, that will rot, those things that won't last, those aren't the treasures that you should be seeking. He's like that. We have all these things that are competing for our attention, competing for our devotion. He's like, only me, only, only am I the only treasure that, that actually is worth your devotion. If you guys want to flip back to um, 1 Timothy 6 with me. In 1 Timothy 6, 15, this is what Paul says. He says, the Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time, God the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, can see. to him be honor and might forever. And here Paul is basically saying, this is Jesus. This is why Jesus is the treasurer. Like, he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the ruler. Like, there are kings, and then Jesus is the king of those kings. There are lords, and then Jesus is the Lord of all those lords. They're, like, he is the ruler of everything. Like, when you're standing, just when you're standing in front of the throne of God, when you're standing in front of the king of kings, like, do you really think you're going to be able to bring your devotion to something else? There's no way that he is calling us to treasure him. Like Christ is saying, I am on the throne. I am above all. Like I will not compete with others' devotion. I will not compete with 
all these other, all this other devotion. Like, he deserves our full devotion. He deserves our full attention. He deserves our full worship. He is the treasure. You know, maybe you're saying right now, maybe you're saying, well, I've got, I've got everything I need. Like, I don't really need this. Like, I've got everything I need. Well, have you ever thought, maybe you, maybe you don't. Maybe you have everything that you want, but you don't have everything that you need. You ever thought that? Or maybe you, you know, you, you're like, Christ is my treasure. But maybe, maybe it's just, maybe you've kind of let, but, but right now, like, maybe your heart is just not satisfied by that treasure. Maybe your heart isn't devoted to that treasure. Maybe you've actually left that treasure. And maybe you need to come back to Christ as being your first love. That's where I've been at. That's where I've been at for the last just few months. And I've just been kind of, it's, it's been, God has just like, pff, like blown my mind away the last few weeks because it's just like, he's like, I will be the only one that you will worship. I will be the only one that you will be devoted to. I am the only treasure. All this other stuff, all these other things that your mind is fixated on, those things are, they just don't matter. Like, worship me. Here's the thing, whenever there's an addiction, whenever you have an addiction, there's a point where you have to say, no, I'm not going to feed that addiction. But this is what happens, is that you say no to one addiction, and then it's like, well, I'm not going to like, I'm not going to do this, or I'm not going to be addicted to this. Like, oh, I'm done with my Netflix, I'm, I'm done with this Netflix thing, but I'm just going to like, what other series can I watch now? Have you ever guys, have you guys thought about that? But it's like you just are like replacing one addiction with another addiction. Well, let me ask you, what would it look like to be addicted to Christ? What would it look like to be addicted to Christ? What would it look like if we were just so captivated by Him, where we were just holding on to Him as our treasure? In verse 12 in this passage, Paul is saying, fight the good fight, take hold of of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. This is point four. That we are holding on to the true treasure. You might say, well, why? Why is Christ the treasure? He's the treasure because he gives eternal life. Not just like, you know, he gives eternal life in the future, but also right now he is the source of life. That when we come into him, we are found. That, that he can't be taken away like all these other treasures. He won't rot, but he is forever. And he is worth all of our true devotion, and that all these other things cannot satisfy us, and that he is the one who satisfies us. And guys, when we are addicted to Christ, when we are addicted to this treasure, it's just like, I will do anything for this treasure. Like, I have to cling to him, I have to hold on to him. It's like if you think of your hands, kind of just do this for me. Just like hold out your hands like this. And just think of all those things, of all these treasures that, that are stealing your devotion. Just let them go. They're not worthy. Like they're not deserving of our attention. They're not deserving of our worship. They're not deserving of our eyes being fixated of that, on that. Just let them go. Then hold your hands out like this. Think of all the, all the good things that God gives you. Like for me, I have a beautiful wife. I have a son on the way. Like even this ministry, just a chance, the opportunity to serve you guys. Just open your hands up like this. All the things like that will happen in your life, all the good things, just hold your hands out like this. He will give and he will take away. These things are not meant to hold on to. These things are meant to, hold, to have your hands held open. He will give and he will take away. Then clench like this. The only thing that we are to hold on to, the only thing that we are to, to, to grasp onto, to, to clasp our hands onto, to cling to, is Christ. And we're to hold on to him with dear life, with everything we've got, every ounce of who we are. We're to hold on to that treasure because he is the only one who is worth it. The only one who can satisfy, the only one that will last forever. With the only one, hold on to him. 
So maybe you're thinking, well, what now? <laughs> what now? Like, okay, so what does this actually mean for me? And this is uh, kind of the first point in the little application. The first thing is, what now is be content. Be content. Verse 6 through 8, Paul says, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. This word content in this passage, it means sufficient. That Christ is sufficient. That his work on the cross was sufficient. That whether you have much or whether you have little, wherever you're at in your life, whatever situation that you're in, that he is sufficient. That we don't have to just be chasing after stuff, chasing after this dangling carrot forever. But that we can be just satisfied in him. <laughs> This doesn't mean like complacency. It doesn't mean like, oh, well, I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. That's not, that's not what this word means. It means thankfulness. This heart of thanks. That because I have Christ, I have much. Just because I have the cross, because I have him as the treasure, I have much. And I have so much to be thankful for. That's our baseline. Whether or not we have all the extra stuff, like that's the baseline, and that is more than enough for us. More than enough for us to be thankful, for us to be content. Even if you think of that word, content. Just say it with me. Content. There's like a, uh, that word content, to be satisfied. You know, Christ, in, in that passage in Matthew 6, he continues and he says, don't worry. Don't worry about what you eat and drink. Don't worry about what you wear. He says, because the Father, the Father feeds the birds. The birds aren't like in the field, like tilling the ground. The Father just gives them food. The Father gives the birds food, and he goes and clothes the lilies with splendor. He's like, man, if the Father's going to do that to like the birds and the lilies, like you have nothing to worry about. Jesus is saying, seek first my kingdom and all else will be given to you. But that is our, that's our baseline. It's just seek first him. But this is the second application point, is that put your hope and trust in him. Put your hope and trust in him. If we skip down to verse 17. Paul says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. That we have a good father, a good father who wants to, pro to provide for us good things. That if we ask for bread, he's not going to give us a stone. If we ask for a fish, he's not going to give us a snake. But we have a dad who wants to take care of us. Like, here's the reality. Like, when I was around your guys' age, and when I, right after I graduated, I could have played it safe. It just would be a lot easier to play it safe. You guys ever thought that? Like, man, it's just easier just to, to play it safe, not to take any risks, you know, just kind of like go with the flow. But I feel, I, and at that time, God was just kind of calling my heart to something else. And I was like, man, I don't know. Like, I, you know, maybe I'll just be a nurse. Like, maybe I'll go to nursing school. At that time, I was a PCA, which I still am. I'm like, maybe I'll go to nursing school, and then I'll be able to, like, get a bunch of money, and then, then I'll maybe do, like, this pastor thing on the side. And I was like, but, but it's just like, it just it didn't settle right in my soul. And I was like, I, I know I'm stretching. I know I'm reaching. Well, maybe I could be a doctor. Maybe I could do this. Or maybe I could do this. And I'll, I'll, like, be able to provide for myself through this way, and then I'll be able to kind of do this whole pastor thing on the side. And there's this one night when Felicia and I were in India. I'm just like praying, and I'm like, God, will you provide for me? Like, will you provide for my wife and my family? We weren't married yet, but I was like, oh, I knew we were going to get married. I didn't have, like, kids on the way, but I knew that that could happen. I'm like, will you provide for my family? Have you ever asked that question? Us men, you should be asking that question, because that's the question that goes through my head all over and over. Will you provide for my family? And this is God's answer. He says, am I not faithful? Am I not faithful? So I'm like, okay, what can I say to that? Of course you're faithful. I'm going to take a step of faith. I'm going to, tr I'm going to take a, a leap of faith. I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to follow you. I believe that you're going to provide for me. 
And my family said, oh, yes, I'm going. So I started this process of raising support. And then the first month in, we realized, like, oh, we're going to be pregnant. So now we actually have a due date, and I'm feeling like under the gun. In the last six months, I've just felt like pressure, stress. I'm asking myself the question, will I be able to provide for my son? Will we even have enough in order to like put a roof over his head? And then like three weeks ago, this is what happened. I had a friend from work who was like, man, there's this really cheap house. You should check it out. I'm like, okay, well, it's too small. The house is way too small. But it started this process of like, oh, well, we'll just go and we'll kind of check out some houses. And this one Saturday, Felicia sees this house, and it's like the most perfect house. And we were like, we're not going to buy a house unless it's like the perfect house with the perfect price. And this house was like cheap. It was so cheap to the fact that our mortgage is actually less than what our rent is right now. That's crazy. And it's this perfect house. And we're like, oh, my gosh, this is like God. He has it like... That God is literally like laying that we prayed like two days before that. We're like, God, we need a place to stay. And literally he's like, I'm going to like drop this house from heaven. Maybe that actually happened. Maybe that house wasn't even in that neighborhood for 50 years. I have no idea. But he drops this house down and he's like, this is the perfect house with a park in the back. I mean, so that my son can run. And I'm just like, this is incredible. There's still an issue. We're still on our lease for another four months. Think about the math. That's like 775 times 4. That's like 3,000 bucks. And I'm like, how? I mean, we got to get, I can't pay for both a mortgage and our apartment. That's crazy. We've got a month to go. I'm like, God, you have to do something. So we put the, we put the apartment on Craigslist. And we don't get any hits. This one guy comes and he's like, no, this isn't my place. I'm like, no. So we're just like, what? I mean, it's, it's been like weeks and we've got nothing. I get this email. And she, and from this, from this lady, and she says, is it still available? And on the bottom of her email is this, this verse from Job that says, there was a time where I had just heard of you, but now I actually see you in full. And I'm like, no way. This woman's like a believer. This is crazy. So I go and like show her the house, and she's like, oh, I really like this place. We kind of like to, to like share our story and be like, it's just cool. Like you just see Christians that you've never met before, and you're like already like, man, like, we're out, like this is awesome. So we're like, she is like, oh man, like I am coming from UC, I'm coming from Cincinnati, I'm moving up here, I'm an adjunct professor, and I need a place for four months, and I need to move in on January 1st, and I need a place that's close to campus. I'm like, one, we're moving out on January 1st, two, like we are close to campus, and three, this is just like the absolute perfect place for you because our lease ends in four months. <laughs> She's like, I've been praying for this place. I've been praying that God would provide a place for us. And I'm like, me too. I've been praying for you. Like, we've been mutually praying for each other. You meet our needs. We meet your needs. Like, God meets all of our needs. How incredible is that? She sent us an email right after that because we were like, well, we'll just give her the safety deposit. We'll just, like, forget about it. And she sends us this email, and she's like, because you guys are giving us your, your security deposit, your safety deposit, like, God, just, just through that, God was like, I'm with you. We were able to bless her, and God was able to tell her, I'm with you. God is, he wants to provide for us. He want, he's on our side. But only if we put our hope and trust in him. Here's the question for us. Is he calling you to take a risk? Is he calling you to take a leap of faith for him? Or will you, will you take the, the road less traveled? Or, or will you just go with the stream? Will you trust in him even if that means leaving comfort and security? The last point, the last application point is leverage generously. Verse 18, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Here's the reality. Some of you will make boatloads of money. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. But will you leverage it? 
where you leverage everything you have for him. And here's the thing. Every single one of us, we are rich in comparison to the rest of the world. If you make more than $2 a day, you are rich compared to, like, a third of the world. So all of us, this is all of us, whether you have a lot or little or whether you will make a million or whether you will make 50000 or 20000 will we leverage everything for him? If you buy a new car, will you leverage that for him? If you buy a house, will you leverage that for him? If you buy a new pair of sneakers, somehow, can you leverage that for him? Will you, whatever job you get, whatever career you're in, whatever major you're in, will you leverage that for him generously? It's like everything for the sake of his kingdom in order to draw people into his treasure. In order to, that song that we sang today, in order to bring people into that throne room so they can actually see who he is. You know Solomon, he had this really cool throne of ivory and gold and lions. It's not even a comparison. It's not even a comparison to who Jesus is. And it's not even a comparison to what that throne is going to look like. We have a chance, we have an opportunity to have our hearts sold out to that throne and bring people into that throne room. Because, and, and to brag about that, that's not a thing to be ashamed of. That's not a thing of like, man, I don't, that's, that's, that's kind of cool. Like, that's ho-hum. No, this is the stinking king of kings. And we get to bring people into that throne room and be like, that is who Jesus is. That is who my God is. No other treasure. And could you imagine... What it would it look like if we were a people who absolutely embraced that with every essence of who we are? That we were absolutely devoted to Him. That we were absolutely addicted to Him. That it's like when I wake up in the morning, it's like, I can't get enough. How can I get my fix of Jesus today? Could you imagine what would that would look like if we were those people? Can you imagine what type of impact we would have on this campus? The reality is, when we are satisfied in Him, we will glorify Him. When we are satisfied in Him, we will glorify Him. Could you imagine how our satisfaction in God could actually glorify Him on this campus? It's a question for every single one of us today. What is your step? You know, what are you holding on to that you need to let go? You know those things that, that you're just kind of like, like letting your like letting go. What are those things? Or maybe it's a maybe it's a good thing that's in your hands that you're holding on to. You're grasping on to. What is the thing that you're holding on to? Maybe it isn't even money. Maybe you're like, this doesn't even apply to me. But maybe it's just your, there's just another treasure in your life. What is it that you're holding on to that you need to let go? And what do you need to do to embrace the treasure today? We all have an opportunity this Christmas. Let's put the Christ back in Christmas. You know, like, but we all have an opportunity this Christmas. We all have an opportunity with our lives to live for something bigger. To hold on to a better treasure. So I'm just going to pray for us and ask the band to come up. And I just, I'll be honest, guys. I don't want, um, personally... In my own life, I am tired of having messages, just sitting in here and having messages like come in and go out. Like I, I just want so badly for myself and for all of us to just hold on to Christ so badly. I want to worship. That is my hope and my prayer for you guys. I ask you just, just, just to think about this this week. What is your treasure? So I'm just going to pray for us. Um, Heavenly Father, God, I pray, Jesus, that, um, Lord, that, that you would change our hearts, that our, the devotion of our heart, the inclination of our heart, God, you just break us of these things that we're holding on to. You just break us of these things that, that God, we've been, we've been working through this the last few weeks of all these issues in our lives that I feel like we're holding on to, that our culture wants, to hold, wants us to hold on to. God, we declare right now, no. We're, we will not be fixated on those things. 
Those things will not rob you of worship. Those things won't rob you of the devotion that you deserve. We will make a stand, like what Paul said. He says, stand firmly and hold on to eternal life. That God, right now we're saying, I'm going to hold on to eternal life. I'm going to hold on to, to the life source right here. I'm going to be right in front of the throne. I'm going to embrace you and cling on to you and hold on to you with dear life because you're the only thing that I, I can have. The only, the only thing that matters. The only thing that will satisfy God, you have to work this out in us. You have to, to give us new hearts. Jesus, we thank you for you, God. We are content in you. You are sufficient. In your name we pray. Amen.